talk about the murder of Martha Moxley. I've known about this case for a long time and for some reason it uh, is one of those cases, there's a handful of cases that just stick with me. And this is one that I wanted to do. I really love the police reports for this. I did have some inside knowledge of the case through Henry Lee who uh, testified at the trial on this case. And I looked at some photographs um, and talked to him briefly about it at one point in time, but not nearly enough. So, Martha Moxley, she's 15 year old, um, attractive, uh, popular girl who lived in Greenwich, Connecticut. And on October 30th, the day before Halloween, which is known as Mischief Night, she was murdered. She was found the next afternoon, I believe, by. Uh, basically a search party. It was a friend of hers. So she was found underneath the tree on her property. And it wasn't that big of a property, but uh, Bellhaven Estates, I believe is the, the area, very uh, upper echelon of, um, you know, wealthy people who live there. So that's the background of the case. Um, that's what we have to go with, okay? Now I know all about who's arrested later and stuff like that, but I'll get into that. I wanna take it step by step. I wanna walk you through what I'm seeing, okay? That's the background, that's what we know. 15 year old girl, attractive, popular. Her body is found the day before Halloween underneath a pine tree on her own property. So that leads us to the crime scene, okay? What do we see? We have a girl that was beaten, uh, blunt force trauma to the head, so much so that uh, part of her skull is actually hanging over by a piece of skin in front of her face. How do we what, know what the murder weapon is? A golf club. A golf club that was shattered into four different pieces with the force that was used to hit her skull. Various pieces of that golf club are found within the area of the body, along with some blood drops where it appears that the assault happened elsewhere. Uh, I wouldn't say this is a body dump location where she's found, but she was moved from where the initial assault took place. She is found laying face down, her pants, her and her underwear are pulled down to her knees, ankle area. That's significant. Uh, no sign of sexual assault. And she, like I said, was dragged from the initial spot about 70 feet from what I understand to where she was found. So now we have the crime scene laid out, right? That's, that's what you got now. Background and you got the crime scene. Now we gotta look at victimology. What type of person was she? Well, I already told you she was attractive. She was popular, uh, very friendly, a good girl, a straight A student. She uh, was a member of the basketball team and she was a typical teenager, uh, would hang out with friends a lot. And as a matter of fact, on that night, she was hanging out with friends. So that brings us to the timeline. 
very basic t timeline, you know. I don't need to know right now what she did uh, 48 hours previous. I want to focus in within a couple hours of her murder. And we don't know exactly when her murder took place right now. Uh, we just know that she was supposed to be home at a certain time. She didn't arrive. Mom went and checked some places, went back home to sleep, and she was eventually found. The medical examiner, and I believe this was in years later, would say that, and I believe it was Michael Bodden, that the time of death was between 9.30 p.m. and 10 o'clock p.m. So that gives us a good baseline. What was she doing an hour previous to this? She was hanging out with friends. These friends were neighbors and their names were Michael Skakel and Tommy Skakel. Michael and Tommy's claim to fame is that they are nephews of Robert Kennedy. So they are of the Kennedy clan. They were neighbors. Nothing unusual, Martha hung out with them a lot. Would go over there and hang out. They had an RV, they'd hang out in the car. As a matter of fact, this night, that's what they were doing. Around nine o'clock, she's with a couple friends. She was with Tommy Skakel, who was 17 years old at the time. Michael Skakel was 15 years old at the time. They are all hanging out, um, listening to music in the car. By all accounts, the people in the car have said that uh, one of the cousins, I believe Rush Skakel, wanted to use the car, so they they went. Now, this is where stories differ. Okay, Michael says that he went with this group uh, was eight miles away and watched a television movie, Monty Python, The Flying Circus. One of the girls who is unrelated to the Skakels and was just a friend of everybody in court testified that Michael did not go. But the other people in the car originally testified Michael did go with them. It's unclear right now whether that is the case or not. Gonna have a drink of coffee. <sighs> okay. So Tommy Skakel. He's the 17 year old. He is the last person seen with Martha. After the group leaves and, and drives away, Martha stays with Tommy. Initially, when police interview Tommy, uh, he says that, you know, he's he seen her, but he went inside and was watching a television show with his tutor, Ken Littleton. Ken Littleton's first day on the job. He's a live-in tutor. He's living there. And that is what Tommy says. Michael says that, you know, he was watching the movie. So basically the, the investigation kind of stalls there. Because Michael has an alibi. Tommy has an alibi. Him and Ken Littleton both. That's their, their alibi together. So, you know, where do they go? Well, apparently it, it didn't go anywhere other than they identified the golf club that was used to bash Little Miss Moxley's brain in from, and I, I'm sorry to be, it just bothered me. So I didn't mean it for it to come out like that, but the golf club was from a set of golf clubs from the Skakel residence, okay? So now you have a murder weapon and you have it linked to one of the last two people known to have seen her, Michael and Tommy. Now, through interviews, it is known that those golf clubs are not always put back. Sometimes they're laid in the yard, they're, they don't get picked up. That is nothing unusual. But um, later, I'm going to get to a statement that Michael made that I find awfully uh, peculiar and telling. But let's go back to 1975 when the murder happened. Everything kind of peters out, okay? 
nobody could believe that anybody from that area, that wealthy area, could have done it. It had to be an outsider. So fast forward to, I believe it was 1991, they reopened the investigation again. And what happens is the Skakel's father, Rushton, knows his boys, Tommy and Michael, are under a cloud of suspicion for this murder, and he wants to clear them. So he hires a private detective agency, and they have full access, they can interview people, and what that did was it shined a brighter spotlight on Michael and Tommy. And the reason is, now they come forward with different stories. Tommy says, on the night in question, me and Martha actually fooled around. Um, he described it as mutual masturbation. I'm not sure if that is the, the correct term, but they had some sort of sexual interlude that did not involve intercourse. Um, then he says she left and he went inside. Michael now says, I went over to her house to her yard where the pine tree is where she was found underneath i climbed it i threw rocks at her window to watch her undress um and i ended up masturbating in this tree now you're asking yourself why did these two not tell that story to begin with and i'll, I'll get into why i believe that they didn't but now you got to look into you know Okay, what suspects do we have? You definitely have Michael and you definitely have Tommy. The tutor, his first day on the job and this happens, his first night there and he was looked at. But um, because of the crime scene, and I'm gonna tell you what it tells me, I think we can rule him out. So the crime scene tells me this. Who, whoever did this, now, I'll disagree a little bit with my colleague, Henry Lee, on this. I believe at trial, he testified that this was a sexually motivated murder. I disagree with that a little bit. I believe that it was based on rage, retaliation. The rage was there. She was hit at least, I believe, eight times with this golf club until it shattered. You know how much force that takes? And then after it shattered... They took the remaining shaft part and stabbed her in the neck. Okay? That's a lot of anger. Her pants and underwear are pulled down. What does that tell me? That tells me, and she was not sexually assaulted, okay? Sexually motivated crime? Yeah, it could be. But it tells me that whoever did this was more than likely infatuated with her, curious of always wanting to see her naked or have some sort of sexual fantasy for her, but never could achieve that through either his inadequacies or because of her rejection which I think is more probable. Or it's used to degrade her. Those are the two that, I, that I've seen. I've done many cases where I've seen this, where a victim is shirt is pulled up, pants are pulled down, or vice versa. And it's either to degrade them even further, or again, it's to see something that I've always wanted to at least see. I believe that it, the crime scene shows an inexperienced killer that was going strictly on rage leads me to believe a teenager or younger adult. Um, if it's a younger adult, I believe that they, they were not popular with girls or did not have a lot of sexual activity with girls. If it was a teenager, I feel that it, it was more of a inexperienced 
in a sexual realm type area. But that's all secondary to the rage. So that's what the crime scene tells me. Also that she was dragged. She was dragged from where the initial assault took place, which was in the driveway, more than likely, to that area, which is a pine tree, it's dark. There's only two reasons you do that, okay? One is to delay the discovery of the body, or two, you had that, you had that rage that's already being let out, but you want to fulfill that sexual curiosity. So you drag them over there. Which one do I think it is? I think it's a combination of both. But it was probably done by somebody that I believe was under the influence of alcohol if it was a teenager. And the reason I say that is because of, of the rage and somebody that wasn't thinking too clearly because you're just, you're, you're not, you, you are delaying maybe the discovery of the body, but you're not going through great lengths to hide the body. What I mean by that is you'd already grab a weapon to use. I guarantee you the Skakel residence has a shovel, you know, if this happened to 10, if you were thinking clearly, you really wanted to get rid of the body, A, you, you would use a car and get rid of it, which leads me to believe again, that it's more than likely a teenager who didn't have access or being able to drive a vehicle. Because if you could, you would load the body into a vehicle and drive it. You wouldn't let it lay there or you would bury it. Again, it leads me back to a younger person, probably a teenager, 15 year old. Yes, that's absolutely. So, so now that we, that we know that you have to start looking into your suspectology, Tommy, Michael, I mean, that's who it comes down to. And maybe an intruder years later, uh, Kobe Bryant's bleed cousin had come forward and said, Hey, I was in that area. Some guys had told me my friends, two of my friends, that they were going to take a girl caveman style. And it was that night. And then this happened. He had been very adamant about that. He testified to that, uh, a video, at least testimony at trial. I, I steer away from that based on this crime scene assessment, what the crime scene tells me. It doesn't tell me that it was done by a stranger. That rage, that crime of, I don't want to say passion, is more anger, but I don't see a, I don't see a random person coming into that town doing that, that, and then pulling down the pants like that. To me, if that was the case, they would have sexually assaulted, they would hit her over the head one time, knock her down, rape her, and then kill her. This, that didn't happen here. There was no sexual assault. So to me, that totally leads me away from whoever this Tony Bryant is pointing fingers at or any random intruder. To me, it was somebody within that area. Uh, so you look at the suspectology. Why did they lie? Okay, why did Michael lie about it? Why did Tommy? Well... I can see why both lied, certainly, because they both would have been, one, embarrassed. Michael, he's not going to want to tell anybody, especially police, the day after the murder, that he was in a tree staring in her window and masturbating. Number two, Tommy, why would he lie? Well, obviously, he's the last person seen with her, okay? And he, he's, if he did have that some sort of sexual interlude with her, um, he doesn't want to admit to that because I think that elevates him even further. And he was already at the top of the list as a suspect. So he just, you know, say, hey, I didn't see her. I went inside what it is, what it is. So 
what's the truth? Well, that's very hard to tell. Now, Michael through the years had confessed to a bunch of different people and I find that odd, but I don't find that odd in his, I guess, uh, the way he is. So if you do a background on him and start looking, he seemed like the time that was he was very boisterous maybe, or very cocky, always got into trouble as a teenager, drank a lot. Um, so it was a boastful thing to me. What I, what, I, what I find odd, and I said that I'd get back to this, in one of these supposed confessions that Michael gave, he said that he drove her skull. Now that's significant to me, okay? Remember, I always tell you that it's, it's the small things, okay? If he, I had, a, I had a case one time very similar to this. Very similar. Actually, I think it happened on the exact same goddamn day. Not, not 1975, but I believe it was October 30th. It might have been October 29th. That's crazy. But the victim was 12 years old, and she had her pants and underwear pulled down, and she was found in a cornfield. Um, but what I'm getting at is when I was reading the reports of a witness, everybody was trying to discredit this witness that saw this little girl get into the car with the offender. She, her statement was, yes, I saw her. She was walking towards the car and then she skipped, you know, her last step and got into the car. Well, it was very significant because if she was lying, in my opinion, she would say, I saw her walk into the car, but she gave that little extra adjective, skipped. I guess that's a verb. <laughs> but that little thing, she saw that, okay? She saw that, and that made that credible. To me, it's this little thing. He said, Michael said to the witness, I drove her skull. Drove her skull. Drove is a golf term, okay? When you do a suspectology in a background and you're looking, it's, it's not significant enough that the golf clubs just came from the Skakel residence, okay? Did they play golf or were they just there, you know? Well, from what I researched, Michael did play golf and that is a golf term. Normally you would say, you know, I bashed her skull. I hit her in the skull. You don't say I drove her skull. By saying that, I drove, that's a golf term. So that was very significant to me. So what happened? Well, it's my belief that more than likely, uh, oh, let me preface this. I read her diaries. Okay. She kept the diary entry. Um, and it was very telling to me. Not only did it show a happy 15 year old had a whole life ahead of her, but it also showed that her main affection was Tommy and Michael, okay? She seemed to be a little bit more intrigued with Tommy, probably because he was better looking and he was older um, than Michael. But Michael was more of a pest and he was more, uh, it seemed aggressive, even though there was passages in there about Tommy putting her hand, his hand on her knee and stuff. Michael would get angry at this, kinda, um, and it seemed like Michael had certainly, in a, uh, I don't know if infatuation would be a proper term. That might be a little strong, but maybe not. Maybe it was an infatuation. He had an affinity for her, that's for sure. So this is all, you know, based off of what I see, I'd love to get the police reports, but I can envision Martha being with Tommy that night and putting the brakes on, you know, this ain't going any further. Tommy gets frustrated, goes up, but Michael, who through his own admission, being in this pine tree, who he's, I'm not saying he's telling the truth, but being in that pine tree and looking into his window, I guarantee that's probably something he did 
previous, okay? So he's a bit of a creeper. He is, I wouldn't put it past him to have been spying on Tommy and Martha and seeing this. And then when she leaves him, he's drunk, he's irate, he's incensed that that's not him, okay? And that she's choosing Tommy over him. He grabs a golf club, he sees her walking, he just runs up and hits her. Boom. Hits her again. She's stumbling, whatever it is. Dogs start barking. People will hurt things around 10 o'clock. She makes it to the grass area off of the driveway. She had gravel in her side of her face, supposedly. So I'm assuming that the first hit put her down in the driveway, but she tried to crawl, get away a little bit. She made it to the grass. And that's when the real assault took place. That's when the real rage and anger came out. You know, and he's probably saying under his breath, you know, you know, just anger, cussing her out, calling her names. If he wasn't doing it out loud, he was doing it in his head. Adrenaline's still going, right? You know, grabs her, drags her, either by her feet or her arm or both, underneath that pine tree. Starting to come back down, but not really. You know, his, his anger um, is probably not fulfilled. Grabs what's left of that shaft and sticks it in her neck. Now, he's, he still has that sexual frustration. You know, I'm going to get or I'm going to see what I couldn't this whole time. Now, I don't know about her shirt. I would not be surprised at all if I found out that her shirt was pulled up or it would be hard to tell because she was dragged but her bra being disheveled because I don't think he would stop just at looking at you know her vagina area I think the breast would definitely be involved but he certainly pulled them down again could be to degrade her I've seen that before but in this case with everything else I think it is more of I'm going to get what I've always wanted and now you're asking yourself, well, why didn't he rape her if he wanted to get, well, she was already dead. You're already in a panic of what you just did. Um, there could be various reasons as to why that she wasn't raped. Um, it could be that he, you know, felt that he, the commotion, maybe the dogs were barking and, you know, hey, I'm going to pull down her pants, underwear, see what I see and I'm out of here. That's kind of what I envisioned happening. And I'm not saying Michael Skagel did it. He, he was arrested. He went to trial, you know, 20 years later, was convicted. Uh, I believe a grand jury indicted him. He was convicted of the murder. But in 2018, he was released. And I believe he was released due to ineffective counsel, which basically means that the court just said, hey, his high-priced attorney didn't represent him well enough. Um, so he's out, he's free. And so did he do it? Hey, all I know is what the crime scene tells me, that more than likely it was a younger person. Again, you start stacking things up, probably didn't have a driver's license or he probably didn't have access to a car or he would have removed that body with the underwear and pants being pulled down, more of a curious type of situation. Um, not an adult, certainly not an experienced uh, murderer. So, I mean, th th that's what I see in this case. I'd, I would love to, Mark Furman, you know, say what you will about him, wh whether he's whatever, a racist cop or what he did at the OJ trial or what he didn't do. Uh, he worked on this case. Now, I remember Henry Lee telling me something that, you know, he said something like Mark Furman goes around saying that he solved this case and he didn't or something like that. Uh, but Furman had a lot to do with this case getting reopened or and Skakel being arrested. Um, I can't make a 
I can't make a hundred percent positive point my finger and saying it was anybody until I'd have police report access and more crime scene photos, not just the one or two that I had saw. I, I need more. And then I can start pointing fingers and saying this and that. But until then, I just can't do that. But I will say that um, it's a very heartbreaking case and I felt so bad for the mother. Boy, did I feel bad. Dortha Moxley had to endure all this. It's just uh, heartbreaking. And she's been on record saying, without a doubt, she believes it was Michael. That's not unusual for a victim. Uh, I remember a case that I had and I could convince the victim's mother at any given week that it was a certain suspect, you know, because they rely on you. You know, they look into your eyes and they believe what you tell them. And you know, so I'm sure the police, Mark Furman and others, certainly not convinced her, but gave her the reasons that it was Michael and very good reasons. Okay. Now, Bobby Kennedy, his cousin, is very adamant about Michael not doing this. I understand that and I get that. He seemed to have some good reasons, um, but it's the same as a suicide. You know, I've worked many equivocal deaths where I told this of a senator that hired me because his daughter committed suicide and he believed it was murder. And, you know, I looked at it and it was fairly simple that she committed suicide and he just couldn't accept it. It's the same thing with people being accused of murder, you know? They don't want to accept it. But again, you only see what those people want you to see. Behind closed doors, you have no idea how people react, okay? You just don't know. One of the things that you really have to look into, and I forgot to put this in my video about the 10 steps to solve a cold case. If you haven't seen that and you want to investigate cold cases, you should watch it. But one of the things that you really have to look at in suspectology is proclivity, okay? So what's proclivity? What does the suspect, what is he prone to do? In one of my cases where a 12 year old girl was murdered, my suspect months previous to this, all the way up to a couple days previous, the homicide, was trying to pick up younger girls. He was, I believe, 19, 18, 19, and the girls were 13, 14, 15. Never anybody his own age. But witnesses come forward and say, yeah, I was just walking down the street. He pulled up alongside me, asked me to get in with him, go for a ride. Another says, yeah, he asked me to give him oral sex. Those are all proclivities. He had the proclivity to younger girls. And not years we're talking months, weeks, days to this homicide where he killed a younger 12, 13 year old girl. Proclivities, remember that. I would wanna know Michael and Tommy's proclivities uh, besides the proclivity to get drunk and get high. That seemed like a very dysfunctional family. Um, just because you have money, that doesn't cure your woes, okay? Again, nobody knows what people do behind closed doors. So that's it for Martha Moxley. I guarantee you there will be a follow-up on this from me. Um, maybe I'll try to reach out to uh, Dr. Lee again. I haven't talked to him in a couple years since his wife passed. It was the last time that I talked to him, but maybe I can get some uh, more of the police reports or crime scene photos from him and uh, go from there. Um, I guess that's it for Martha Moxley. Thank you. And I hope you guys learned something from this. And if there is any other suggestions, you know, on cases, you know, let me know. Uh, if I get time, I'll look at them. But uh, thanks for all the, all the support I'm getting. You know, the channel's growing tremendously.
I mean, I've gotten 10,000 new subscribers in the past couple weeks, two weeks. Um, so I must be doing something right, I guess. I always felt that I had a passion and knowledge to do this. I thought the TV show that I did, The Hunt for the Zodiac Killer, and a couple of the other shows, you know, would show, you know, what I can do and my passion to do it and to help family members. And that did for a little bit. But my goodness, I didn't realize the power of YouTube. I never want to be called a YouTuber. I still don't. I don't like that. I'm not a YouTuber. I'm a detective. Okay? I've always been a detective and I always will be. I just use my detective skills to bring this to this platform, which happens to be YouTube. So, it is... I, I've been getting emails, uh, letters, messages on my Facebook from... And I always have. I always have. For the past 10 15 years family members so on and so forth um but now you know I, i'm getting them from other respected people in the business and that means a lot to me the, their encouragement and support so i'll keep doing this as long as you guys keep wanting it you're getting like an educational view an experienced view of a cold case detective of what they would see or at least what I would see I guess I can't say what other people would see because obviously I don't agree with other people a lot of times they don't agree with me and that's fine but I'll give you reasonings why I think so and so is occurring or why it happened so uh that's it thanks for tuning in again for this one Martha Moxley and if anyone out there has police reports get over me love to look at them okay Maybe that. Oh, sexy.